Hello. <laughs> How are you? Let's have a little bit more of Garth Nick's book, Drowned Wednesday, which is, of course, book three of the Keys to the Kingdom series, if you didn't already know that. So, last time we saw Arthur, he was being chucked over the edge of the ship. Oh my goodness, can you remember that? Dr. Scamandros wanted whatever Arthur had in his hands, or in his pocket, remember? The Atlas gave him like an electric shock, and so Scamandros said, get him off of here. And so they were about to chuck him over the edge. <gasps> Let's pick it up from there. Ready? No! Screamed Arthur. Then, as Sunscorch continued to lift him up, I'm a friend of the Mariner, Captain Tom Shelvock. Sunscorch lowered Arthur to the deck. Prove it, he said coldly. If you're lying, I'll carve... Oh, I nearly forgot the voice. Prove it, he said coldly. If you're lying, I'll carve you a set of gills before I throw you over. Arthur reached with a shivering hand into his pyjama top and pulled out his makeshift floss chain. For a dreadful moment, he thought the disc was gone, then it slid free and hung on his chest. "'What are you waiting for, Sunscorch?' yelled Dr. Scamandros angrily. He, didn't he have a high voice, like a trumpet? "'What are you waiting for?' <laughs> "'What are you waiting for, Sunscorch?' yelled Dr. Scamandros angri angrily. "'Throw him overboard!' <laughs> I just can't do a high voice. Sunscorch looked closely at the disc, flipped it with his finger and looked on the other side. Then he sighed and let go of Arthur. Just then the ship rolled to port and back again, almost sending Arthur over the side anyway. Do as the, do as the doctor says, Mr. Sunscorch, called Caterpillar. We must have a course to get away. I ain't, Captain. I ain't doing it. The boy is the mark of the mariner. If he asks for aid as sailors, we have to give it. I am asking, said Arthur hastily. I don't want to be thrown overboard. I only want to send a message to the lower house or to the far reaches. He has the what? From the who? asked Caterpillar. Sunscorch sighed again and helped Arthur along the sloping deck to the group gathered around the wheel. Dr. Scamandra still had his hand under his arm. He scowled at Arthur. No seaman will go against the mariner, said Sunscorch. This boy has the mariner's medal, so you'll have to figure something else out, Doc. He ain't going over the side. The mariner, said Scamandros, a figure of reverence for the nautically inclined, one of the old one's sons, I believe. Yeah, said Arthur, though the question hadn't been asked of him, and the architects. Perhaps I was a little hasty. Scamandros continued. I thought perhaps you had something in your pocket we wouldn't want aboard, but any friend of the mariner, please, do accept my apology. Sure, said Arthur. No problem. Well, uh, welcome aboard, said the captain. We're delighted to have you here, though I fear that our voyage is um, about to be cut short. Everyone looked back over the stern. The shiver had closed in and was now less than a mile away. She'll be firing her bow chasers soon, said Sunscorch, if they have any powder. They have the weather gauge too. We'll have to fight it out. Oh, said Concord. He swallowed and frowned at the same time. That doesn't sound very good. Can you get us a better wind, Doctor? Asked, Sc asked Sunscorch. Untie one of your knots. No, replied Scamandros. Feverfew is already working the wind and his workings are stronger. There is no escape within the border sea. And uh, is there um, no plausible course out to the realms? Caterpillar pulled his sword partly out of its scabbard as he spoke and almost cut his nervous fingers on the exposed blade. There is one possibility that I may have overlooked due to extreme pain in my hand, said Scamandros. I cannot cast the Harris spices because of magical interference, but the young have natural ability, so this boy may be able to. Can you read the portents of the future in the strewn intestines of animals, young sir? No, said Arthur with a grimace of revulsion. That sounds disgusting. They uh, don't just use intestines anymore, whispered Ichabod. Just magical jigsaw puzzles of intestines. In Indeed, the art has grown more orderly and less troublesome for the laundry, said Scamandros, who clearly had very superior hearing. Though, personally, I believe it's best to be trained the old way before coming to the puzzles. So, you are not a Haruspex or Seer? No. Then you shall cast the pieces and I shall read them. 
Scamandros took a large box out from under his coat, bigger than the one he'd put away before. He handed it to Arthur. There was a picture of an ox on the box, the back half cross-section to show its innards. Quickly now, take the box and empty the pieces into your hands. As Arthur opened the box, something shrieked overhead. It sounded like a cross between a train whistle and a petrified parrot. Sunscorch looked up, then muttered, They've got They've got powder. No, no, Sunscorch. They've got powder. That's a ranging shot. And started to shout more commands to the helmsman and the crew. The moth lumbered and rolled to port as the wheel spun and the crew hauled on lines to trim the yards. The horizontal spars on the mast that the sails were attached to. Arthur knelt down on the deck and put his hands in the box. Though all he could see were pieces of coloured cardboard, he recoiled as he touched them. Ugh, they feel like raw mints, or, or worse. Ignore that, instructed Scamandros. Pick them up and cast them on the deck. Do it quickly. Arthur shuddered and hesitated. Then he heard the whistling again and a huge plume of water exploded just behind the moth, showering them all with freezing water. Over and under, said Scamandros. Sun scorch grimly. They'll have range inside a minute. Arthur took a deep breath and plunged his hands into the box. Picking up the pieces was like picking up handfuls of dead worms, but he got them all, raised them up, and threw them at Scamandros' feet. As before, the jigsaw came together as it fell, but this time all the pieces joined to make a perfect rectangle. The colours ran and shimmered like spilled paint, then formed into lines and patterns. In a few seconds, a picture appeared. A picture of a rocky island, a mound of tumbled yellow stones surrounded by a sea of curious colour, more violet than blue. Scamandros looked at the picture, muttering to himself, then he rolled up the chart at his feet and immediately unrolled it again, revealing a completely different map. Forlorn Island, Sea of Yazir, on a planet we call Jerain. That'll do. Uh, Mr. Concord, said Caterpillar. Uh, Mr. Sunscorch, said Concord. Prepare to cross the line, roared Sunscorch. Idlers, take hold. Caterpillar and Concord rushed to the rail and gripped it. Sunscorch joined the two denizens on the wheel. Scamandros picked up the jigsaw, which didn't fall apart, and stood by them. Grab hold of a rope or a way at rail, Ichabod instructed Arthur. When a doctor shakes, look down and close your eyes, and whatever you do, don't let go. Arthur did as he was told, taking a firm grip on the port side rail. He looked back at Dr. Scamandros, who was holding a jigsaw and muttering to himself with occasional instructions to Sunscorch. Port five, steady, he said. Starboard ten and back again amidships. Hold her as she goes. Port five, port five, starboard ten. The moth rolled and tilted first to one side and then the other, but didn't seem to change its actual direction very much for all the turning of the wheel this way and that. But Dr. Scamandros kept ordering small changes of direction. Arthur heard a muffled bang come from behind them and looked astern just in time to see the flash of the shivers bow chasers, followed by that same whistling screech. This time it didn't end in a water spout or a pass overhead. Just as Dr. Scamandros shouted something unintelligible and threw the jigsaw in the air, Arthur heard a terrible splintering, crashing noise that momentarily blotted out all other sounds. But he didn't look. He closed his eyes and bent down as instructed, hoping that whatever the cannonball had hit wasn't going to fall down on his head. There was a moment of silence after the terrible sound of some major part of the ship breaking. Immediately followed by a flash so bright, Arthur's eyes were filled with white light, even through shut eyelids. That flash was accompanied by a crash of thunder that shook the whole ship and stirred a vibration so strong it made Arthur's limbs and stomach ache. Arthur knew what was happening at once. His hand went to the invitation card in his pocket and he hunkered down as low as he could, still clutching his pocket. They were about to pass through the line of storms again. The thunder was so deafening that its echoes lingered in Arthur's ears and head, so even when it ceased it took him a while before it stopped trembling and hearing started to return. The afterimage of the lightning remained in patches, and dark spots danced around his eyes. Arthur opened his eyes to a scene of destruction and wonder. One of the huge horizontal spars from the moth's mainmast had been struck by the cannonball and broken half. <clears throat> broken off. Half of it had sprawled over the deck and half was in the water, a tangled mass of timber, ropes and canvas. Arthur only glanced at that, his attention was drawn ahead of the ship. 
There, extending upward from the sea into the sky, was a huge gilt picture frame, easily 400 feet long and 300 feet high. It bordered an enormous, brightly glowing version of the jigsaw picture Arthur had made, with the Yellowstone Island and the Violet Sea. But this didn't look like a picture. The sea was in motion, there was purple-tinged clouds drifting above the island, and birds or bird-like things were flying all around. Arthur could still see the jigsaw piece outlines, much narrower and more wriggly pieces than in a normal jigsaw, but the lines were very faint. Starboard watch! Cut away that yard! Quickly now! The moth rolled as sun-scorched spoke, sending its sails flapping to make a sound like sarcastic applause. Helm! Hold us steady! shouted Sunscorch. The moth was trying to sail straight for the framed image. Arthur saw. He understood, and it wasn't an image. It was a doorway to another world out in the secondary realms. Did we lose them? asked Sunscorch. Did we lose them? asked Sunscorch to the doctor. Scamandros looked stern, lowering his smoked glasses over his eyes to stare at the now surprisingly distant line of storms. I wish they had easier names. They're all very similar, Sunscorch Scamandros. They're all, they're, yeah, I'm tricky with the voices in this chapter. I'm not... No! Arthur looked back too, blinking at the still bright flashes of lightning, though they were now several miles away. At first he couldn't spot anything. Then he saw the silhouette of the Shiver's dark sails. She had dropped back, would, but would soon catch up again, particularly with the moth slowed by the broken spar over the side, which acted like a large and clumsy sea anchor. They'll try to follow us through the portal, said Sunscorch. Um, is there anything, some manoeuvre or other? asked Caterpillar anxiously. Get away from that. Get that spar cut away, roared Sunscorch. Arthur winced. Clearly Sunscorch got louder the more anxious he was. Dr. Scamandros looked ahead at the vast gilt-framed doorway to the violet-hued sea. It was several hundred yards away, and he still looked back at the pursuing ship. Pursuing ship took out a pencil and made some calculations on the cuff of his big yellow coat. At our current speed, Feverfew will board us short of the portal, even if they don't take down a mast or a hole of, between the waterline. He won't fire again. Don't need to, does he? We're slow enough now. Anything more might damage the loot. This confident assessment was immediately undermined by the report of a cannon astern, resulting in another plume of water, this time well short. Then again, he might sink us for sport added Sunscorch. He looked down at the main deck where the denizens were hacking ineffectually with axes at the fallen yard. Cut away! Don't slap at it! Cut! Doctor, is there anything you can do? Do it! No seamanship can save us now. On for an axe. Carry on, Caterpillar called out as Sunscorch leapt down the companionway to the waist of the ship. Arthur looked at the rapidly gaining pirate vessel and then at the living picture in its vast gilt frame. Even without calculating anything, it was clear the shiver would catch them before they would get to the transfer portal, because it was too far away. Arthur suddenly had an idea. I don't know about sorcery or anything, Arthur said, but that big plate painting is like a transfer plate you step on, isn't it? Scamandros nodded distractedly. So, if we can't get to it in time, can it somehow be moved to us? Scamandros frowned, then cocked his head as if he was struck by Arthur's suggestion. Arthur noticed that all the small tattoos on the doctor's face were showing scenes of trouble. Storms at sea, sunken ships, exploding suns, imploding planets. Just as the doctor opened his mouth to speak, the shiver fired again. Interesting, yes, it's theoretically possible to... Whatever Scamandros was about to say was lost, as a cannonball struck the moth's side just behind and below the wheel, smashing the heavy timber into a spray of deadly foot-long splinters that went whistling across the quarterdeck. Whoa. A real pirate battle. Oh my goodness. Do you think they're going to make it to the frame? I don't know. Or is Feverfew going to catch them? He's going to be very interested in Arthur, isn't he? Hmm. Right. Okay. I'll see you all tomorrow. I hope you have a lovely evening and fall asleep mostly in the UK. We're having a real hot time at the moment. What? Now I'm back to work. Now I'm back to school. The weather is beautiful. Hmm. Gosh. So, um, if it's very, very muggy where you are, it's muggy here then I hope that you keep cool enough and have a lovely sleep. Whatever the weather is where you are, I still hope you have a lovely sleep. Good night. See you tomorrow.